environmental impact statement uh, that was recently posted. I'm not sure that everybody's read every page, some 2,000 pages, but uh, you know Steve has, and he's gonna give you a PowerPoint presentation in 30 to 40 minutes to cover that whole um, study. So, you're probably wondering what's a Monroe County person sitting in Coon Valley in front of you, specifically in Vernon County, kicking off this meeting. Well, to be specific, or the simple answer would be, I was asked, but we're gonna flip it, and Ben's actually gonna be in Monroe County later today and introducing um, the Westport kick study, so. But the reality is, we're all tied together based on what happened August 28th, 2018. Flooding doesn't exempt, doesn't follow municipal boundaries, doesn't follow property lines, cropland, roads, streets, etc. Everybody was affected in some form or fashion that's sitting here today. Whether you're a conservationist, emergency management director, a town patrolman, an elected official, we're all here with specific interests, but it all revolves around flooding. And so this is an opportunity to voice on what you see based on what the, the results of this study as we move forward. Again, this is a historic watershed we're in. We just recently um, celebrated nine years of the first federal Coon Creek watershed project. And so back in the 30s was an historic moment. It was about flooding. I don't use stopping, it should be managing. And then we get to the 60s and building these flood control structures to stop the flooding again. And that's where the 14 structures that we're gonna talk about today were born. So today is a historic turning point watershed as we look at decommissioning these structures and then what we what do we do in the future so it's important that everybody's here participating and uh, kicking this off so with that I am gonna have the the firm that was part of the process in assessing the structures stand up and introduce yourself and then we'll move on to the our NRCS conservation partners how about you? <laughs> uh, I'm Jimmy Moore. I'm with m &E Consultants out of Temple, Texas. I'm currently stationed in uh, Little Rock, Arkansas. So uh, we're here kind of overseeing and managing the project from the A&E standpoint. Um, so I'm Megan Lush. I work with EA Engineering. Um, we work with uh, M&E to get this plan together. Um, uh, myself and another uh, a few other people in our Lincoln office. Um, I work remotely in Maryland right now. Move around every couple of years for Coast Guard stuff. But um, yeah, did some of the engineering and technical things. Yeah, I'm Charlie McKenna. I'm with Sundance Consulting. We're out of Idaho. We did a lot of the environmental and economic work on the project. And as far as uh, NRCS or the Natural Resource Conservation Service. Steve, I'm Steve Becker, State Conservation Engineer for the USDA NRCS Auto Maps. Next up, who's hiding? Eric? Yeah, I'm Eric Hurley, the State Resource Conservationist, so I'm looking out of Madison. In addition to the NRCS State Archaeologist. Anybody else? Justin? Justin, also, I'm a local district conservationist for Vernon and Monroe County. Uh, excuse me, Adam Dowling, I'm the watershed specialist, just came on board uh, Tuesday and helping Steve out with this project and uh, four or five others we have in the state trying to get them up on the ground too. And then in Vernon County, we have Ben Moyan. Ben and I just want to say it's not Steve's fault. Whatever you're about, <laughs> whatever you're about to hear, we are very appreciative of NRCS and, and their help, and uh, some of them are just the messengers today. And La Crosse County. Matt Animal, La Crosse County Land Conservation. So welcome, everyone. So I know there's a lot of other staff here um, and members of the Coon Creek Community Led Watershed Group, a lot of familiar faces, so welcome today. Um, and I want to thank you for your patience. And I was talking to Steve not too long ago, we were like, holy cow, it's been six years. Time flies, but welcome to the federal process. <laughs> so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Steve to kick off the, the presentation. Thanks, Bob. So, uh, welcome 
uh, to the draft watershed project plan programmatic environmental impact statement meeting. We all coming out on a cold day and I guess we all have one thing in common and that's that is we care about the decisions that are made in the Coon Creek watershed. Um, decisions that started way back in 1933 and we're still continuing that legacy of trying to uh, put a good conservation effort uh, on the ground and to protect our natural resources. So I will start out just a little bit with some of the acronyms. Um, so this watershed project plan was done under the NRCS's uh, watershed program, which has its own uh, authorization. It's a program authorized under Congress and it stands alone. It's not part of the Farm Bill. Um, this is a program, the document that was prepared is roughly 1,029 pages for the Coon Creek and I think 1,046 pages for the West Fork Kickapoo. Um, combination of a watershed work plan, um, invest, investigating uh, and determining what measures are needed to move forward <coughs> and then the environmental document that supports those decisions. Um, it is a programmatic environmental impact statement versus a project level environmental impact statement. There is a distinction. A programmatic is a little higher elevation. Um, we are talking about 14 dams over 100 square miles. Um, uh, it's tough to dive too deep on the economic details at, at each dam, but we did mine very uh, comprehensively into each of these structures. Uh, but nevertheless, under a programmatic EIS, and so when, we, when it comes time to implementing these practices, we will tear down and do a site-specific environmental review, which I feel very confident um, that that would be a fairly uh, minor undertaking. So I'm the NRCS State Conservation Engineer out of Madison. Uh, my official role in this study is I'm the contracting officer's representative on an architect and engineering contract with m and &E Consultants out of Texas and their sub-consultants, which is Forest Econ, did the economics. Steve, can you read your volume a little bit? Oh, sure. How do you do that? That's a good question. <laughs> talk, just talk. It just needs you to talk. Don't get off. Yeah, okay. <coughs> so, uh, our a &E contract uh, is with m and &E Consultants out of Idle House, which is EA Engineering that did the H&H work. Uh, and some of the uh, structural prescriptions and the geotechnical investigation and Forest Econ uh, did a heavy lift on looking at uh, the benefit cost analysis on the various alternatives. So anyways, uh, we set sail on this watershed project plan back in July of 2020. Um, of course, of those of three dams in this watershed in 2018, and at that time we worked, the NRCS worked pretty closely with the county conservationists, uh, Ben Wojohn and Bob McKeel and Matt Hainwall, uh, to not take a knee-jerk reaction to those failures, but to actually take a step back um, and re reassess the functions and values of the flood control measures and <coughs> kind of see where to go forward. We received the, the funding for this study, which is in the ballpark of $1.8 million in July of 2020. And here we are, uh, three years later, uh, publishing the draft. This draft will be available for public review and comment for the next, well, for 45 days until February 20th. Um, 
at that time we'll close the public comments we'll officially address all those comments in the administrative record and they, then we will we will publish the final environmental impact statement on the federal register and then the NRCS state conservation engineer uh, state conservationist will uh, uh, render a record of decision and we will uh, hopefully sign a project agreement with the counties uh, to implement the measures prescribed in the plan. So these, the Coon Creek Watershed Project Plan, PEIS, like I said, is 1,026 pages. It's not an easy read necessarily. Um, and so my job today is to provide kind of a to, my job today is kind of to lay out what the preferred uh, recommendation or preferred alternative is in the plan um, and pull out elements of the plan that defend that decision. So I'm kind of giving you an uppercut, saving you a lot of reading. This is the crib notes, I guess. So um, I did invite members of the, uh, of the engineering team that pulled this together. I should say engineering team, consulting team. Um, I will say that this document um, is the culmination of about, I think I did a, a quick cut, there was somewhere around 45 people that were deeply involved in different aspects of the paper, so roughly 45 uh, uh, professionals and conservationists, people who really kind of care about the watershed and have an eye what's important to kind of pull this together so um i need to move a little quicker so i, I better start i'm glad i threw a lot of pictures in to compensate so this is you've probably seen this photo in a lot of uh meetings in the coon creek watershed over the years um i wanted to take a few minutes or a minute or two to make a distinction between uh, the, the Coon Creek demonstration project in 1933 and the construction of the dams which started in about 1954 so um, the demonstration project in 1933 was primarily uh, upper land treatment removing cattle from woodlands putting in uh, strip cropping um, elements of upper watershed land treatment. The dams were kind of conceived and developed later to address uh, some of the flooding in the valley. And so there does, I think there does need to be a little bit of a distinction. They were done a little bit separately. So this is kind of a, the watershed boundary in the location. 14 dams over 107 square miles. You can see the, the watershed that's controlled by each dam uh, shaded in the upper right. The flood control dams only control about 27% of the watershed uh, down to Chase or to Coon Valley. Uh, the watershed study was hydraulically and economically was prepared all the way through uh, Chase Bird. The original plan that um, did the original economic analysis and uh, the flood control prescriptions that was prepared in 1958 and that plan is on the public facing website if you're interested in seeing how the original plan compared to the plan we prepared today so this is just I don't know for better or worse it's just kind of uh, you can certainly see uh, the main stem of Coon Creek and the tributaries and the topography defined by deep valleys and ravines. Um, but the watershed boundary kind of follows the roads, right? And so we're going from starting up by Pasht and uh, at the upper, toward the west side of the watershed. 
watershed boundary goes to Westby up to Coon Valley um, through uh, Newburgh Corners and Middle Ridge. It's kind of a table summarizing the 14 dams. Uh, they kind of they have a site identification number and they have a structure name. Uh, probably aligned with the people who own the dam when it was built. Um, this is in, of course, this is an ex excerpt out of the plan, so everything that I show you today you can find in the plan, you just have to kind of drill down for it. Um, the drainage areas between the dams, uh, for each dam ranges somewhere from 200 acres to uh, roughly 2,000 acres behind each dam. The dam heights range anywhere from 25 to 39 feet. Uh, the storage volume behind the dams is 27 to 209 acre feet. Most of the pools are dry, which means they have a low flow uh, inlet. Um, they're designed to catch uh, the runoff from large storm events store the water and let it out slowly through a principal spillway pipe to attenuate flood hydrographs. So there is uh, four of the dams were considered or classified as high hazard by the DNR because of the potential for loss of life. And the shaded dams are the ones that failed in 2018. Luckison, the and Corn. So you can kind of commit that a little bit to memory that the ones that failed will show up a little bit later in the report. So the scope of planning. Uh, when we initiated this planning study, you, you go into it and you have to have a purpose for planning and a need for planning. So to summarize that, the purpose for planning was to evaluate the flood control measures in the Toon Creek watershed, the cache in the Chaseburg, and determine the measures that are eligible for federal action through the NRCS Watershed <laughs> Protection and Flood Prevention Operations Program. The need for planning was to eliminate the additional uh, potential for additional dam breaches after the failure, the three failures in 2018. Those three failures, just to kind of give you a blow up if you haven't, I don't know how familiar you are with these sites. Um, if you happen to have gotten out to one or two during a conservation tour in the past, but uh, this is a drone footage of the Luckison Dam failure in Monroe County. They're all very similar, the breaches start to see a trend or a pattern and we'll talk a little bit more about them later. This is Bill Hopi Dam in Monroe County. Once again you can see they are earthen dams so they they do blend in with the topography a little bit. I'm not sure how familiar you are you all are with the functions of these dams and how they kind of look on the landscape but you can see the failure around the left side. Looking downstream this photo is looking downstream is at the top and the breach was off on the left side, the left side looking downstream. You'll also see some erosion in the auxiliary spillway that was designed to take overflow uh, on the right side. And this is the last of the three dam failures. This is the corn dam failure in Monroe County. Once again uh, a failure or breach to the valley floor along the left side and severe surface erosion in the auxiliary spillway that was designed for overflows on the right side. So the preferred alternative in the plan is to decommission all 14 dams in the watershed. We had a, uh, a meeting with cooperating federal and state agencies and the county staff to try to just determine what decommissioning actually meant uh, and what it looks like. But to summarize, 
and although the details uh, would be determined during the final design of those <coughs> decommissioning plans, it's to excavate a notch in each dam to pass the 100-year flow event unencumbered, to contour that excavated embankments and valley walls downstream, remove this principal spillway pipes, risers, cantilever outlets and plunge pools, shape and seed all the slopes to a stable and safe angle of repose, and vegetate the accumulated sediment pools, and eventually allow the sediments to discharge over time with the geomorphic process downstream. So that was a decision made in concert by, like I said, the agencies uh, and the county staff present um, to remove these dams from the valley floor would be on the order of $3 million. And it's just not only is it uh, the quantity of the earth fill that would have to be removed, but you're also reinforcing haul roads and trying to procure properties to spread that dam material on. And the dam material is in all topsoil. It's, it's got a, a fairly cohesive clay core and it has a shell of excavated materials out of the foundation. So it's not <coughs> necessarily conducive to farming to put it on farmland. So anyways, at the time the decision was made that that just <coughs> The economics of that wasn't in line with the, with, with the, the need uh, and the purpose of just trying to open the dams up and allow the 100 year flow to pass through. There were quite a few other alternatives avail available or evaluated, I should say. And I wanted to list those, pull them out of the report and list them. Of course, no action is a required alternative. Um, in you know, all of these federal plans, but we also looked at repair, replacement, rehabilitation, building additional, not only replacing the ones that are there, but to build additional dams. We also looked at land management changes. Um, as an option to replace the function of the dams, is it possible to make uh, changes in land use in the upper watershed uh, to create the same level of infiltration and runoff effect to reduce the 100 year uh, hydrograph versus putting the dams in place to store and release the water slowly. Mm -hmm. We also looked at replacing the large dams with a multitude of smaller farm ponds. So I just, there's pages uh, backing up or evaluating each of these alternatives, but I just tried to put a summary statement behind each one. Um, so the no action alternative, what it doesn't do is address the failure modes that still exist in the remaining 11 dams. The remaining 11 dams have a high potential for failure um, and no action approach really doesn't uh, address that potential. Also, uh, the failed dams are under a D DNR administrative order uh, to formally decommission those dams. The intent isn't just to leave them the way they are. Um, repair like I said, does not address the failure modes that in the remaining 11 dams that caused the previous three failures. Uh, the replacement of those dams, from an economic point of view, the benefits don't exceed the replacement costs. So to replace 14 dams, uh, to meet today's standards, would be on the order of 61 million. Uh, rehabilitation, uh, basically, reconstructing the dam to today's standards on its current footprint. If you were to rehabilitate these structures to meet today's standards, not much of the original dam would be left. Uh, a 
additional dams was dismissed because the, the benefit to cost ratio of the dams that are currently here uh, don't come close to meeting the required benefit cost ratio of one uh, to replace the ones that are there, much less build additional ones. We looked at land management changes which are effective in the upper watershed, but those land management changes would be on roughly 24,000 acres of cropland that are under private ownership, and so we've deferred those alternatives to other USDA programs like EQIP, RCPP, and then we also looked at replacement of large dams with a multitude of smaller ponds. Um, once again, it is effective under certain conditions, uh, but it would take an awful lot of ponds, and if it was done under this program, the footprint of all those ponds would have to be acquired. Uh, there'd have to be land controlled by the county, and those would have to have easements on all those properties, and the counties would have to assume period of 50 years. So we decided that those that type of uh, conservation effort would be best done under other U voluntary USDA programs. So the cost of the preferred alternative, uh, the construction costs to remove or decommission the 14 dams is $3.8 million. Uh, the engineering fees is $359,000, permitting about $28,000. Grand total is about $4.4 million. Um, we did uh, in the preferred recommendation to remove those dams, it would be the judgment of the people presenting the report is that that work would be done within a five year window. And that would put a lot of strain on the dam removal grant program from the state. And so we requested a variance from the NRCS national office to rather than have 75-25% cost share, 75% federal, 25% local, uh, we got a variance that the, the, fed, the federal government would pay 100% of the construction costs. There is still a, a county share that's associated with permitting and a proportionate share of administrative fees, uh, but for the most part the government would cover the decommissioning of those dams. So what caused the failures of those three dams? I think that provides a lot of insight into what needs to be done uh, looking down the road. So we had a couple of Geotechnical engineers, a couple of geologists uh, visit each site. Um, they use some geophysical tools to take a look into the foundation. Um, we had a lot of geology uh, and geotechnical reports uh, from several of the dams that have been repaired in the past. They were able to kind of create a concept or a model of what went wrong. Um, and it all kind of boiled down to geologic stress fractures or cracks in the sandstone foundation along the abutments in the valley bottom. So those cracks, they create, you can imagine when the pools are full, those cracks create preferential seepage paths under and around the dam. And those cracks water's moving through those sets up a mode of internal erosion that eventually fails the structures. <coughs> so the steps in that failure mode is when the water's moving through those cracks, it's eroding out fine grain soils of the embankment where the dam interfaces uh, the side of the valley wall. <coughs> the soil in the dam moves into those open cracks and gets mined out. Dam failure in 1976. About the process of the 
using deeper cutoffs and internal drainage features. So the Coon Valley dams were built between 1961 and 1963, so that predates this failure that brought national attention to bear on at least that failure mode. The NRCS, through the watershed program, we built 12,000 dams across the country between roughly 1960 and 1971. And that really was the infancy of dam building in the country and a lot was learned over that period of time. So what's missing in the Coon Creek dams? Well, a couple of things. One is defense against internal erosion. Um, off into the bedrock along the abutments in the valley floor. And there are technologies available now to get a deeper cutoff under the dam. Um, you know, the old fashioned way was just to excavate, rip rock, or blast, and kind of create a, a trench and fill that trench with compacted clay material. That's one option. But now there's also technologies for a bent like slurry trench and concrete secant walls. So I was in Minnesota, I was a project engineer where there was a big dam near Canby in southwest Minnesota. And uh, the dam was built on 70 feet of sand. And when the pool filled, they started seeing sand boil in the outlet channel. And so they needed to put a deeper cutoff in front of the dam. So they put in this bentonite slurry trench. It was 70 <coughs> feet deep with vertical sidewalls and it stretched for a mile and a half. It was quite an impressive effort and I only mention the fact that it can, with enough money it can be done. So in the case of these dams the recommendation is to key into these foundations about you know, somewhere between 30 and 50 feet. Once the foundations are excavated out to 30 to 50 feet, you still, you still have cracks stone or fractures. Before you start building a dam against that cracked sandstone, they call it dental grouting, but they power wash all those cracks off and they fill all those cracks with grout. When they're done, they lay as a redundant safety measure, they put a blanket drain or a button drain against that so anything that's still seeping through that foundation um, will be captured by an internal drainage system and taken safely out the back of the dam. And lastly, the Coon Creek dams don't have uh, embankment drains. Um, that was a fairly new technology developed in the early 80s. But basically there's a sand wall through the entire dam through the center line of the entire dam. So the dam is built on a valley that's uneven, and so it's possible that portions of the dam might settle more than other portions of the dam, and it would set up a situation where there's a crack in the dam, and water can move through that crack. These chimney drains, this wall of sand that runs through the entire dam along the center line, has the ability to. Uh, capture that water and also s the soil can't pass through it and so it's sort of a self-healing mechanism to address differential cracking. So all of those features uh, that came about through heightened awareness um, and how engineers learn the hard way, um, all of those features are not in the remaining 11 dams and um, it's a vulnerability. Secondly, you can remember from those photos, there was some spillway stability and integrity issues. And those words are very specific in that there's very little resistance to surface erosion um, and breach resilience in the auxiliary spillways. Mm -hmm. And so, Here's kind of a blow up of the auxiliary spillway. This is designed so when you get a storm 
bigger than what was designed for, right? The Coon Creek Valley, anything. In some dams, it was over a 50-year event. In others, it was over a 100-year event. Going over the top of the dam and taking out your investment. You want those flows to go around the dam, and so we create an overflow channel. We call it an auxiliary spillway. We've learned a lot about auxiliary spillway design uh, in the last 50 years. And we've had our hydraulic lab in um, Stillwater, Oklahoma do a lot of modeling for us. Um, and they've broken the modeling into two, port, two, two parts. One is providing resistance to surface erosion, and that's what you see here, where basically the flow scalps off the topsoil and the sod. Uh, and, um, Mark Erickson, who's the Vernon County Dam Tender, has seen this phenomenon a lot <coughs> over the years. These dams have overflowed in the past. Um, and NRCS has usually come by and we try to help with the repairs through the Emergency Watership Protection Program. But a lot of the dam failures, uh, you could also see <coughs> evidence of this occurring there was also a lot of dams that were over top that did not fail, but still show those signs of auxiliary spillway stability issues. Uh, the remedy is, of course, is to increase the width and use erosion soils. Um, but there is, those valleys are very narrow and there's not a lot of room for extra width. And the auxiliary spillways most often are put up against the valley wall where there's seepage you know, we've had a lot of uh, springs and seepage develop in the last few years that people forgot could ever could, ha could happen, right? We're in a stronger hydrologic cycle over the last 15 years, and there's reports all over of uh, increased base flow and seepage in different parts of the valley, so. Uh, the second integrity and that is we design our model of the auxiliary spillways to see what would happen over time and how much resilience they have to actually having a head cut breach the pool and so instead of looking at the top two feet for auxiliary spillway stability you're actually looking at about a 20-foot profile down through the auxiliary spillway and you're trying to model whether if there's a head cut, how long it would take for that head cut to advance into the pool and evacuate all the water suddenly. And so, a lot of the structures in the Coon Creek watershed wouldn't uh, stand up to the design rigor or auxiliary spillway integrity today. The remedies for that, of course, are something that provides cutoff or um, more bulk. And so one of the ways that you can install concrete cutoff walls, something that would interrupt a head cut. But in some places, you just simply give up on a vegetated auxiliary spillway and run all the water through a concrete chute down through through the center of the dam, and you'll see that bear out. Um, here's a little bit of a summation of the economics. The original economic analysis in the 1958 work plan that was used for the, the design um, and construction of the original 14 dams the economic bar was the same for federal assistance as it is today. The benefits have to exceed the costs. So we talk about a benefit to cost ratio of having to be one to one or better. So in the 1958 work plan when they were devising the strategy for 14 dams they came up with a benefit cost ratio of 1.2 to 1. 
there would be a dollar twenty in benefits for every dollar spent on construction and maintenance of the dam over a period of 50 years. The economic evaluation period was 50 years. So we had a unique opportunity here on in this study to look at to do a retrospective analysis, which meant we went back to all of the rainfall records for the last 50 or 60 years and we compartmentalized those rainfalls into storm bins. How many two-year events were there? How many 10-year events? How many 50-year events? How many 100-year events? And each one of those events were associated with a certain amount of model damage in the floodplain. We also tried to harvest all of the costs that were associated with the original construction, the repairs, the inspections, the operation, the maintenance. We tried to gather up all of those costs. And in the end, Charlie, he's there and you can throw tomatoes at him. <laughs> the actual benefit cost ratio was 0.9 to 1. And it, Charlie will I'll give him an opportunity to speak to the group here a little later, but for all practical purposes within the noise sensitivity of that analysis, um, that was a break-even proposition. And that's, I think, what most people hope for when they're spending federal money, is that the benefits equal or exceed the costs, and I think the dams served their purpose um, and provided an adequate benefit-cost ratio. <coughs> so there was roughly $12.2 million in estimated benefits based on model damages prevented in five damage categories, and each category had 11 types of economic damage functions that was used by the economists. We figured there was about $13.3 million in construction and maintenance costs, also in five categories. So in the retrospective analysis here, the chart on the right shows how many storms of various sizes that we that we got over a 60-year uh, period. So I think that's pretty interesting in itself. Uh, the chart on the left uh, shows the retrospective benefits apportioned by each individual dam, which I think is kind of important because when a dam needs major maintenance or repair, before you dive in, you kind of like, is this repair worth it? And I think a chart like this gives you some idea of whether it's worth it. These are in $20, $20. So, you know, the original 14 dams were built under a water. Federal funding was used to build them, <coughs> that the counties would be responsible for operating and maintaining them for a period of 50 years. And if they failed to do so, they would have to pay back the money to the federal treasury. Well, that period expired quite a while ago. And so during that period of time, people really didn't question whether the repair was of value, you just repaired it because there was an agreement to maintain these things for 50 years. So there wasn't a big investigation of whether the cost of the repair was equivalent to the benefits. But now that that 50 year economic evaluation period is over, <coughs> the dams are under sole control and authority of the counties. So now there's a choice to be made, do you repair them or not? If I might add something here, you uh, are looking at a table of the watershed drainage acres uh, and how many watershed acres are behind the dams. But when we're looking at flood protection, it's how many acres are protected below the dams. And it varies with the strength of each type of storm event, two year, five year, 10 year, 100 year, etc. And what we don't see in this table is that for Coon Creek, what was the average protected area per dam? It was 14 acres. Yeah. I so, so 
the area below the dams that is actually protected from flooding is extremely small. Now it is spread over a long distance. And when I first saw this, you might, you might have a dam influence area below the dam that might be two miles long. But we're talking about protecting a little strip of land along each of those flood paths. You might have a light flood path, you might have a strong flood path, but you're still looking at a very small strip along the sides. We're not talking about where you would have flooding in a prairie where it would go everywhere. We're talking about very deep ravines with really small protected acreage. And the benefits are generated from the, not from the watershed above the dam, but from the number of acres protected below the dam. And that's one of the things that undercut the economic returns and benefits for, for the original set of dams. And also, any reconstruction of those dams. Thanks, Charlie. So here's a slide on the uh, projected economic analysis. Um, to replace those 14 dams, the benefit cost ratio came up to uh, 0.1 to 1. So it would be 10 cents of benefit for every uh, dollar of construction and maintenance costs over the next 50 years. So the benefits would be 5.6 million, and it'd be about 68 million dollars in cost for replacement and maintenance. <clears throat> so the original dam construction, I think, is kind of interesting. The original dams were built for about 81 thousand dollars per dam on average, right? And so that's about 580 thousand dollars per dam in 2020. The cost of dam construction now to meet current standards with uh, the cutoffs and drainage systems that we're proposing million per dam. So that's kind of the big difference. The dam decommissioning benefit cost ratio is also poor, right? It's 0.06 to 1. And there is no tangible benefits to decommissioning the dams other than about 260,000 and an avoided maintenance over 50 years, barring any um, major anticipated repairs. Um, but what that benefit ratio doesn't include is uh, avoiding a dam breach. And it's difficult for economists to wrestle with benefit cost ratio on dam breach because you don't know what the magnitude will be and you don't know when it will happen. So the hydraulic impacts of the preferred alternative of removing the dams, what is that going to mean? So this chart kind of shows the flooded acres with and without the dams. So for a 100 year event, which is kind of your base flood event for like the flood insurance program, people are familiar with uh, floodplain regulations on the 100 year, that's kind of a standard bearer for evaluation. There's roughly a 228 acre difference with and without the dams over a fairly long stretch of stream. You know, if you take the main stem and the tributaries, uh, and then measure it up all exactly, but you're talking about 220 acres sliver of increase over 30 miles. Of course, the effect of the dams is more prominent within the first couple of miles downstream, and then you get much below that, and you have all the uncontrolled tributaries coming in, and so the effect of the dam um, diminishes fairly rapidly as you move away from them. But nevertheless, you can't ignore those hydraulic impacts, right? And so these are some of the uh, 
if you go to the public website that was set up for this project, there's a interactive mapping feature where you can zoom in on your particular property. Well, you can zoom in anywhere along uh, the, the planning study area and s you'll see it mapped with and without the dam so you can get a little better idea of where you are. Um, but these are some of the houses that would now be see some water that wouldn't have seen water if the dams were there. Um, it's not a lot of water. Um, there, there is uh, uncertain, a little bit of uncertainty, of course, in modeling, this kind of a modeling effort. Um, so it's more of a kind of a relative thing to look at. But there are some homes that we're going to see some water that didn't, that, did, that were protected before. Kind of looking at the transportation, you know, there's a lot of crossings across Coon Creek in the valley. You know, 49 crossings. Uh, you know, public and private would lose some protection if the dams are decommissioned. Eight public crossings would be flooded by a smaller storm. You know, that's the effect. And so the most impacted crossings would be Olstead Road and Oakland Road. And that's why the county highway departments have kind of you know, kept them notified of this, this study and, and they'll have to kind of weigh in and react uh, to the information that's provided. So, I don't know if you can read this very well, I'm flashing this stuff up kind of fast, but Olstead Road that's in Timber Coulee, for example, you know, before it would take a 50 year event to overtop that crossing and Without the dams, it would be a 25 year event. There's also some floodplain management issues down those valleys. The, the valley's in the flood insurance program with FEMA. So, what impact would removing the dams have on the flood insurance program? Um, so, this kind of lays out, talk with DNR in detail about it. This is what their expectations are. And this is what they found out. That the, the zone AE or the, the base flood elevation down the, the valley that's associated with the FEMA 100 year floodplain does not <coughs> account for the, existing, the existence of the 14 dams. So there will there is no need to make adjustments in the base flood elevations down the valley. Ten of the 14 dams, if you go on the DNR surface water data viewer, they have no floodplain mapping associated with them at all. Um, and the counties now have the option, if, if they're removed, the counties then would have the option to uh, remove the, the breach shadow zoning. And I forgot to put up the number of acres that would be removed. I believe it was in the report. <coughs> Coon Creek 15, 16, 17, and 41 are mapped as Zone A. Um, in Zone A, there is no detailed study or elevations associated with Zone A floodplain mapping. Um, but the DNR would expect that a letter of map revision be completed that shows those dams removed. Around those dams would be adjusted to reflect the fact they're not storing water. And then there's a whole FEMA process, and there is costs associated with that. Right? So, um, about 25000 per dam to get those uh, the maps adjusted at those four locations. Uh, we took a look at cultural resources. Uh, in terms of architecture, unique and historic uh, buildings and structures that have a unique engineering or architecture associated with them, or buildings or structures that are associated with significant people, um, or buildings or structures associated with um, history. So, and then we also looked at uh, archaeology 
some of these sites have um, are associated with cultural materials, lithic scatters, and uh, remnants of the presence of indigenous people. So these, so we hired uh, University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee, their archaeological archaeological research research laboratory uh, to conduct an archaeological and architectural investigation as part of our responsibilities under Section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act. And so these are the five steps that they went through. Looking through records, doing a field inventory, and trying to make a decision on whether uh, the removal of dams would impact cultural resources. So, we also looked at the dams themselves. Um, these 14 dams, since they were built back fairly close to when the first Coon Creek demonstration project existed, we thought, well, maybe the dams themselves were a historic district. Um, and it would have some significance. So, uh, they investigated that issue. They didn't find that the dams were engineering or architecturally unique. They thought, thought there was enough spatial distance between the Coon Creek demonstration project and the dam building, <coughs> and also the demonstration project had not really had anything to do with dam building. So they are not eligible for the National Register. There were three other properties that were in, an, in or near the 100-year floodplain um, that would be eligible for the National Historic Register. Um, but we took a close examination of the elevations and found out that they were outside of the 100-year floodplain. So uh, <coughs> the only outlier of that was the snowflake skiing. And Clubhouse, I think that ski resort was there since like 1908. Um, that is in the floodplain with and without the dams, however, um, it's significant because of its history, not because of the architecture or persons associated with that ski club. So we kind of got a pass, I guess, on the architectural history. Archaeologically, um, lithic scatter sites were identified at five of the 14 dams, uh, but weren't deemed significant. Um, there were uh, some findings at three of the sites that had enough integrity and density uh, to be archaeologically significant and UW Milwaukee recommended phase two investigations. One of the sites has already failed, so um, we're kind of in discussion with SHPO at the moment on these issues, uh, but it's our recommendation to kind of move forward with dam decommissioning without further investigation. And our reason for that is those flooded before the dams were built, we're removing the dams, they'll still see flood water. But if the dams were to fail, we'd be putting six to ten feet of dam failed material and scour erosion in around the site, so decommissioning the dam is actually a form of protection. So that's kind of our position and we hope to resolve the, the consultation here shortly. There was some uh, fish and wildlife impacts. Um, they weren't uh, determined to be real significant. You know, we will do a, a tiered site-specific analysis, uh, site-specific environmental review before we once we know what the final decommissioning plan really you know, looks like on paper, how much fill material, how much spoil, and where to go. We, do a little better job of making sure there's that sediment is pretty hot and phosphorus. Uh, 
but we didn't find any pesticides or heavy metals. We did go to two sites and tested the sediment pool in two different locations in each watershed. And we tested for atrazine, heavy metals, pesticides, PFAS, and all those. This is kind of a summary of that. It's hot and phosphorus. We didn't find any heavy metals or pesticide residues. Too about, about these different types of PFAS. There's a lot of different forms of PFAS. The one that I looked at um, that just popped out just because it's the highest number is um, PFOS, which is a form of PFAS that has sulfur and, and carbon in it. A little bit different than, than some of the others. And is associated with soil. So this is a soil associated um, PFAS product as opposed to one that's, you know, it's not gonna end up in the, in the water. So we're looking at um, soil impacts and the, the limits there from the Wisconsin ENR of 1.26 parts per million PFAS, that's, that's in the soil. Looking at the units, this is all about units that are up there, um, the 220, I'm just can't tell what I'm pointing at. This 220 is the highest value that we, we saw in these, and that's um, nanograms per kilogram, which is about um, six orders of magnitude less. So what it's saying is that as a comparison value, um, you know, this would be about today. 126 million nanograms per is this value. It's, it is just many orders of magnitude less that was found in the soil than it was what is in the DNR. Um, yeah, that's a soil. good point. The nanograms per kilogram is the same as parts per trillion. Yes. So the this limits is, are the, the limits are in parts per million. So we got a long ways to go to ring the bells for what I can as far as being concerned. I got really goofed up by those units until I started putting in the decimal points and realizing how far apart those numbers are. So the issue of sediment release, um, you know, the dams all across the country are being removed for different reasons. I think there's a major dam removal uh, out in Oregon right now to increase, uh, to eliminate aquatic passage issues for the salmon. The most recent dam removal in this area, I think, was the Bear Blue River. The mode of operation for removing these dams is to kind of let the sediment flush out through the geomorphic process. It's not going to come out all, all at once. You know, there'll be a thread, a channel thread that moves through those sediment pools, and that'll widen and and move sediment over time. Um, but it isn't like all the sediment, the 11, 8, the, the 19 uh, thousand tons, is going to come out in one shot. I don't think that's the case at all. If you if you zoom in on all these dams on Google Earth, you'll see that. In Coon Creek, they're all pretty well dry pools and they have dogwood, willows, sod vegetation, reed canary. They're pretty vegetatively pretty stable. So, how the sediment will flush out probably looks a lot like this photo. I think this is 2024 of the dam breach that happened in 2018. And so, you can see the single channel thread moving up through the sediment pool. I mean, it isn't all that's shooting out of there, and if you were to get a 100-year event, um, it would flood that, you know, it would spread out across that entire pool. What moves sediment is flows that occur on a bank full level every year. That's what's moving the majority of the sediment. A storm that comes once every 100 years moves us a very small percentage of what gets moved annually, right? So, I tried to take a stab at, you know, based on these dam ferries and looking at the erosion thread that's 
phase four thread that's kind of reestablishing through the breach kind of came up with what they thought would be an annual sediment release per year over the next three years. And so it's a little bit of a guesstimate, um, but kind of gives you some idea. And I think there's some context here. You can compare this sediment, uh, Trimble, Stan Trimble did that sediment study in Coon Creek. I think it's pretty important you can pull his study up and compare the amount of sediment that's moving through the main stem of Coon Creek to some of these sediment releases and it's really kind of a very small subset of what's actually moving through the valleys. <coughs> this is the amount of material that came out when the dam failed. So it was somewhere between 14,000 and 28,000 cubic yards of dirt got blasted out of the matrix of those dams. More of an environmental challenge to the fish habitat downstream than uh, breaching the dams and allowing the sediment to slowly discharge. So. Uh, I wanted to take just spend a couple of slides on the, the risk of what happens if the dams breach. You know, there was a few dams that were deemed high hazard because of potential for loss of life. Um, this is kind of an estimate of the population that's at risk below each of the dams. And I don't know, Jim, if you want to speak to how those estimates were determined. It'd be 111, but that's if all dams failed in one night, right? But I mean, right. there's kind of a population <coughs> at risk for each dam. Uh, we went back and looked at the uh, roads that were impacted by the uh, breach of each of the dams and any housing that may be in a breach inundation zone. And the NRCS spreadsheet computed the population risk from roads, the potential county roads or whatever, and houses, and that is one number on that spreadsheet. And another thing that has been looked at is these streams have a lot of recreation from uh, fisheries. So what if we put in uh, a possibility of fishermen, uh, we have recreation days per mile of fish or stream, and then that's where the, uh, based upon the number of stream miles in the breach zone, you have a potential of having a lot of fishermen in that zone if it occurred during the fishing season. So that was another column that was added in there. And so you have a potential of a, pop, of a total population risk. So this doesn't mean that that's going to occur. This is just estimated numbers of uh, what could be impact. And also, uh, I'll just state that Jimmy didn't take this to the next step, which there's a lot of, based on past dam failures, there is multiple techniques for taking the, the, popula the population at risk and estimating the loss of life, which is used uh, to establish the criteria for some high hazard dams in some states. So we kind of left it at the population at risk because the loss of life estimates, which is a subset of that, is really unwieldy and so we just kind of st stopped at this level. Mm -hmm. These are areas that are, you know, the DNR is required that there was a, a breach model done for each dam, laying out what they call a breach inundation shadow or a breach inundation area, and those areas are also zoned out from development in addition to uh, the 100 year floodplain and the flood insurance study program. So it's an overlay. So these are structures that were in identified in the breach inundation areas. Um, and the point being here is that if we engage the preferred alternative, that those uh, places would no longer be in those breach inundation zones. So. Uh, I got to kind of, yeah, because I'm dragging this 
out. I apologize for that. So we did do look at two alternatives to large dams. One was land management changes <coughs> in the upper watershed. Um, and it's, it's an admirable uh, objective and a worthwhile one. And the county land and water departments and the NRCS have been working on uh, land management and land treatment conservation programs for years. Um, and it is an effective way to re increase runoff, or increase infiltration and reduce runoff. Um, but programs have limits, and the watershed program is not set up um, to engage, to fund, to economically justify and run individual projects through this NEPA process in order to secure watershed funding on all that <coughs> private land. Wherever we would put a practice on the ground under this program, the county would have to secure an easement and ensure that it was maintained for 50 years. And that's a pretty high level of commitment. Um, and so the recommendation is to use the program that's most appropriate and there are several under the USD umbrella including RCPP and NACWA and EQIP. So, but I wanted you to know that we did that, this modeling, to take a look at upland land treatment and it was would be extremely challenging to identify practices and try to predict where land treatment improvements would be made and how long they would if they'd be adopted and to what extent they would be adopted. And so our approach was to simply envelope, envelope the best possible conservation outcome. And that was to go back to the hydrology and hydraulic models and model all the woodlands as woodlands and to model the 23,322 acres of cropland um, as unpastured grassland and to see what uh, the floodplain would look like under that scenario. So by upland land treatments, you know, you, you all are probably familiar, you know, with the strip cropping, reduced tillage, no-till, um, prairie strips. So there's a lot of soil health type practices, uh, cover crops. ephemeral erosion like grass, waterways, and farm ponds, and fencing uh, cattle out of woodland areas and things like that. And so um, these are the upland practices that we were challenged to decide what level of adoption would take place and to what extent. And so we just said, what happens to the floodplain if everything was just converted to grass? And then we would have a model for the best possible condition and we would have the present day condition. And that any conservation work done in between could extrapolate on that effect. So this is kind of a nice bar chart, just looking at Coon Creek. The, the report has, reports changes in flow and flow depth at different points in the watershed, both in Coon Creek and West Fork Kickapoo. So the blue bar is uh, the width dams, having the 14 dams in place. The yellow bar is all dams removed. And the green bar is all dams removed and all of the cropland converted to grassland. And this would be the change in flows at Coon Creek. This is an awful lot to take in and so I just want you to be aware of that it is in the report and it's worth taking a look at, right? So you can see that um, <coughs> if I just kind of make kind of a gross observation here. It, I mean, it, it shows that the flows um, are reduced. <coughs> no dams. Uh, with all grass converted to cropland shows a very effective form of flood control 
up to about the 50 year level and then the effect isn't quite so prominent so it's a lot to take in but I think it's worthwhile to look at it and it's it's kind of an interesting comparison here's just looking at flow depths at Coon Creek something that's a little more tangible um, so you can look at the 100 year event uh, that if you compared um, if you compared the flow depth for the 100 year uh, with all the dams in place it's at 15.1 if you got rid of the dams and you placed it with grassland and all cropland you'd have the same effect which is interesting because we got a little bit different uh, outcome in the West Fork Kickapoo watershed but it shows that that's effective it's an effective means of flood control it's just big economic sacrifice to convert all that cropland. So what can be done in between there? There's a lot that can be done in between. <coughs> and um, I guess I kind of leave it at that. This is just looking at peak flows. Once again, it kind of bears out that in this watershed, um, good land treatment actually has possibility of offsetting the large dams it's just a Herculean effort to make that type of conversion so you're looking at something in between right you're looking at something that's why this modeling result a lot of it was turned over to uh, Eric Ruth from UW and he was trying to create an interactive software that would allow the user to go in and make changes in the watershed to see what the effect would be there's also the Ag Conservation Framework tool. There are some good software programs out there to look at everything in between the current condition and everything grassed to look at the effect and see if there is an optimal performance level where agriculture can get along with the floodplain. And so I don't know, Eric, if you want to mention a little bit of Eric, just a little bit yeah. about that. Sorry. So I'm Eric Booth, I'm a hydrologist at UW Madison and you know there are a number of people in the room and have been talking with them over the last several years and I'm really interested in kind of how do we reduce uh, flood hazards in the region and trying to uncover every rock to, to really maximize the potential available. And we've looked a lot at agricultural land and I'm on a few projects that have looked at this in a couple of different ways, but one of them is grass on 2.0 and, and so we're interested in well-managed grazing as an opportunity to increase infiltration and this scenario that Steve talks about is, is roughly kind of equivalent to that vision of well-managed grassland kind of um, implemented at a, a larger scale. Um, I guess I just would make clear that if the, the economic impacts of that is, is a core part of our project and there are a lot of successful, well-managed grazing operations in the region, and I'm sure they can tell you their own story of how they can make that economically successful. So we're very interested, not just on the hydrology side. I'm not an economist, but we have a lot of economic and um, social folks on the project that want to link those practices with developing supply chains so that those types of operations can be profitable and viable. So I'll leave it at that. Thanks, sir. I'm almost, I just got a couple slides here. The other, this is this is in that kind of that same mode, right? Farm ponds, we kind of throw that in with grass wa waterways and upland treatment, and we did kind of examine uh, the effects of replacing a large dam with multiple small ponds, and so it wasn't to do it on all 14 dams because of just cost right but we were able to take one sub watershed and just kind of take a look at uh, what effect that might have on peak flows you're not you're not maybe seeing it makes sense that a big dam could be replaced with a multitude of small ponds but it has a little bit to do with where the ponds are built but in general you know ponds are only built 
the store like on the order of like the 10 year or 25 year event and then they they overtop the landscape positions don't allow those dams to get very big or very tall and so they have limitations um, but they do have an effect and it would be part of the toolbox and once again just like the land treatment practices it's kind of deferred to other programs can you discuss the costs a little bit on 11 dams because is this what we typically would call a grade stabilization structure smaller than what would be being our regulated right the cost um, seems high for 11 dams yeah yeah that'd be about 65,000 per dam i don't know if that included some maintenance with it i don't do you have any comments on that, Megan? Um, <coughs> so as far as, yeah, I know there were size restrictions on those. Um, I believe the... Yeah, I think it's just basically that, it just kind of made, basically the cost, because you're looking about 50000 and I think that Ben's thinking it's maybe more in the order, like, Right, so. like if you did smaller ones, obviously, and also it, it's just so much we don't know where they would be placed, so there's going to be way more efficient, you know, places where the topography makes sense, you don't have to bring in, you know, it's right in that valley, you can, you know, build it up. I, I think the best way to explain it, Ben, would be if you take 650,000 divided by 11, you're around 60,000, there's just a big contingency put on it because we just don't know. Yeah, there's just so many yeah. unknown variables when you're looking at yeah. that many dams times that many objects. I did want to mention just, I just got like two slides. I appreciate the fact that this is my first run, right? And I'm killing you at the time. But <laughs> so you remove the dams, you've got increased flooding in the floodplain. And basically what <coughs> it appears that we're proposing is let the floodplain be the floodplain. Um, you know, I, I will acknowledge that one of the reasons that the benefit cost ratio is so low uh, for keeping the dams is because the counties have been so successful at zoning and <coughs> keeping expensive infrastructure out of the floodplain to start with. The benefit cost of replacing the dams would be outstanding if we allowed all kinds of urban development floodplain and that didn't happen. That's called progressive planning and it was successful here. Um, but that being said, I did have the economists just because people, I've heard the comment that well, we're losing. So I just had Charlie do just almost a, an impractical analysis maybe on the side of what if you were to compensate someone for the loss in protection for the storm series of two to a hundred years if you were to compensate that person for that loss in protection what would that look like and so he just picked out a corn the corn base, right? Cropland and corn on it. And worked it out for 50 years. And if it was possible to buy up a sliver of land along this 30 miles of main stem and tributaries and compensate owners for the loss of protection on that cropland, it would come up to about $9,000 per acre over a 50 year period. And if you were to buy a perpetual easement from them to compensate them for loss flood protection in perpetuity, it'd be around 12,000 per acre. But if you were to take that compensation model, that 9,000 per acre, and you multiply it by the change in the 100 year floodplain by removing the dams, you're at 2 million. That compensatory mitigation concept shows that would be a lot, that's less than the cost of a single dam. It just kind of helps put things in a little bit in perspective. It's not put up there to 
incite a call for compensation at all. It's a very impractical thing, but it, it is a, a way of looking at the problem and defining the significance of the 228 acres. The last slide is we did take a look at climate change because it's in the news all the time. Is this model, is the economic analysis, is it, you know, basically is it robust enough to cover potential climate changes? So we did have a contract with the University of Wisconsin, Madison, to just look at the precipitation depths for the two through uh, 500 year event, just looking at the last 15 years. As people are saying, the last 15 years, uh, the magnitude and intensity of storms in this area has increased. Normally when we do hydraulic studies, we're looking at a rolling 30 year average. So we're stepping outside of statistics and just looking at the last 15 years and they had a methodology to try to make the last 15 years somewhat statistically significant. And what they found was the precipitation depths for the two through the 500 year event on a particular storm would increase about six tenths of an inch. So instead of a 100 year event being defined as seven and a half inches in a 24 hour period, it'd be closer to 8.2. <coughs> So we fed those numbers to Charlie and he worked the economics and the benefit cost ratio just didn't move. When you're looking at benefit cost ratios of the dams projected for the next 50 years, um, a change in precip like this doesn't matter too much. The floodplain in these narrow valleys is the floodplain. A lot of this has to do with just, it's a, it's a matter of depth. With, without the dams, it's more or less a matter of depth. As you can tell from the previous slide, with and without the dams, the change is 228 acres in the 100 year floodplain. It's in depth rather than the width. The valleys are so uh, narrow the flood goes from one wall to the other wall so I think that's I think I got through them all and my timing is terrible so I'm just going to kind of open it up for questions or comments uh, hopefully the team will help me out and we'll try to answer it. so I'll start with this one uh, uh, Jersey Valley you know they did this grouting with the with the concrete is that something that could help sustain these dams is that the kind of grouting that would solve the problem on the edges yeah the grouting that the question was um, the grout curtain that was installed in Jersey Valley Dam which is a series of tightly drilled holes three rows across the entire length of the dam uh, to try to pump grout into all the cracks is that technology valid and could that be used uh, to reinforce the existing dams, right? Yes. Yeah. And I think the answer is no, as demonstrated by the Jersey Valley failure. It didn't work. <laughs> it didn't work. It didn't work. And just to let you know, that was no small undertaking. That was about $4.5 million in 2009. And that substantially changed the benefit cost ratio of the, of the West Fork Kickapoo project, right? But one of the reasons that grout injection had limited success in Jersey Valley is because that technology was tested in like limestone bedrock formations. What we found in the, what, what you can observe by walking along the breach area in Jersey Valley is all of the sandstone cracks and fractures were filled up by loose weathered sand and it rejected the grout. injecting the grout and you're trying to push the grout through cracks that are filled with weathered sand it doesn't go very far so when you're injecting grout every 10 feet across the entire dam the, the scope of that injection doesn't go very far with all the weathered sand in the cracks whereas if that technology was used in like a limestone foundation where the cracks kind of stay clean 
you get more effect from each grouting activity. And so you can see that when you walk through the breach on Jersey Valley Dam, you can see the, the grout see cones. The grout. Yeah. And you'll see where the grout stopped, and then you'll notice that the crack keeps going. And you're like, why wouldn't the grout keep going? Well, at the time, before the water showed up, those cracks were filled with sand. Okay. You just talk about maintenance, but how much maintenance are you actually doing on the dams that currently exist? Because I was hired by NRCS to go out and open a couple of the gates for a town in Sidney Hollow, and they hadn't done anything like that for a long time, so one of them ended up as a flagpole on my neighbor's pole shed. And the, you know, the threads actually bent which they're up in their office in Vernon County. And because they were supposed to open those gates twice a year. Are they doing any of that? Because they weren't at that time. Yeah. Have they continued the practice of opening the gates so that these dams are doing what they were intended to do when they were built? Yeah, the, the question was, would we, would we have had a better outcome instead of having three dam failures if maintenance was more aggressive does maintenance did it play a role and it's our belief um, that it didn't how these dams failed uh, was along the interface between uh, the, the earth fill matrix and the valley wall and it had a lot to do with the geotechnical volume it had to do with the geologic vulnerability um, Operation, operating the gates and maintenance of these dams is an important, uh, plays an important role of how long they'll, they're going to last. I, I, I won't diminish that. I, I, can, I can think of 12 dams, not in, in these counties, but are poorly taken care of, and the gates haven't been operated for so long that they've seized up. And so if you noticed, boiling in the downstream channel or a slope stability problem in the downstream there was no rapid way to draw the dam down to prevent a massive failure there are cases like that but that's not what we found here so they are maintenance in them now or they are not the maintenance is in my opinion it's been very good it's on a regular basis now generally. yeah I, mark you can speak to that feel free yeah we all come and do some the problem with, you know, with the gate idea is that it's only for the base wall and you get a flooding bank. The big principle still where the 4 by 9 concrete drop structure is coming and if you open that little gate, but you really have to do nothing for a flooding bank. Well, if you open it the day before the rain, you let the water down to a certain level. And kind of that bottom of the funnel approach, where the bottom of inch of the funnel is more volume than right the top inch. The, the gates on the uh, the dams that do have gates, the purpose of the gates is for emergency drawdown, but under normal conditions, all of the 14 dams except one are dry, the pools are dry. The, ri the, the way the risers or the inlets are to these dams, they're set up so that the, the gates really have nothing to do with it. They're, they're designed for you know, quick drawdown or to keep the pool dry. Um, when you get a big storm, the top is uncontrolled and left open at all times. It's always available for a big flow. Uh, the dams are not managed in any way for big events like you would see on a, uh, on a gate on the Mississippi or something like that, or on the, on the Wisconsin. Flood flows aren't managed by gates. They're uncontrolled open spillway that allows flows to go into them at all times. Any other questions? Yeah, I got one. With, uh, you talked about uh, the main flow, the dam, you can see one of these little bits in the water from the top of the dam. There's a lot of houses. You take them out, you talk to them, you know, they're all and I don't have that list right in front of me of how many habitable structures are, but you know, it's 
not common practice that we allow navigable structures in the floodplain. We allow no new development, no new outbuildings, no new any of that. Not no more. So right, there are some historical. Correct. Mm -hmm. No, but the question is, and he's right. There are going to be houses or farm service buildings and some houses that are going to be affected when the dams are removed. And we try to define what those are. You can go on that the online mapper and look at the floodplains with and without the dams. And we listed some of the houses here. It is a fact there are going to be some I'll guarantee you more than just one. Yeah. So so that's based on your hundred year <coughs> storm event, correct? Correct. So you may be thinking, you know, what 2018 did too. Uh, the 2018 was closer to the 2018 was closer to the 500 year flood. That was about 11 out, 11 inches in six hours. Yeah. So is the the remapping of the floodplains is that low near cost? Yes. Okay. And is the Lomar process because I was talking to Chris Olds with the DNR and he says that. You know, we need to go through the Walmart process when we take every single one of these out because we're manipulating that flood. Yeah, our estimate is uh, <coughs> we set aside a Coon Creek watershed to make the mapping adjustments. Yep. Yep. Yes, sir. Uh, so I recognize <coughs> that uh, there are limitations to some of the alternatives like land management practices and these small farm ponds. But I'm kind of wondering, instead of this going specifically with the preferred alternative, I mean, can we run uh, those projects and chain them with it and actually look at what the benefits might be for future flood mitigation and sediment loss if you do the preferred alternative and prescribe land management practices and go through, I'm sure, the Herculean uh, nightmare of you know, basically getting easements to do small farm pockets as a means of kind of protecting uh, this watershed within our future models? Yeah, the question's a good one. Can we, is it possible to blend the preferred alternative with dam removal and make major land manage, land use changes? And the answer would be, you know, yes, but within, but it'd be, it's just really hard to to mix that the, the land management improvements into this program with the given the timeline and the re, and the environmental and socioeconomic investigations we would have to do to fund it under this program. I mean, it's, is it limited by I recommend that like each will certainly kind of cover a lot of those things, but I mean, at the same time, mm -hmm. there's a million dollar addition given to NRCS for climate smart practices. Yeah. And that fall under that problem. Yeah, it's just a matter of, it's just a matter of timing. Anything funded under this plan had, has to go through an, a rigorous environmental review. Things that are done under EQIP you could do tomorrow. You can come in and sign up for a farm pond, minimum tillage, incentives for land management practices. At any time you can come in. And we don't, under EQIP or RCPP, all of that work on a national level was evaluated under a programmatic review. There is not a lot of additional time and attention needed to justify the economics or the environmental impacts. You can just run the program sign up, you get ranked, and you get funded within a, a 12 to 24 month cycle. To run it under this program, it has to go through the same rigor that was demonstrated in these slides. And you have that same landowner that we would encounter in 2020 to do strip cropping on 600 acres would still have to be interested four years later to the point where he's willing to sign an agreement with the counties to maintain those strips for 50 years. I mean, the, 
it's just a program that just has a higher threshold for involvement. It's just on private lands is too unwieldy with the amount of land that's leasing, the land control issues, the level of interest. Some people are farming year to year based on what the bank will allow them to borrow. They're just not capable of making commitments at a 50 year level that are required out of this particular program. Can we piggyback off of that comment? So maybe ask you, I'm wearing a lot of hats today, so <laughs> step out into a different. Maybe try and, maybe it's an impossible question for you to answer, but um, try to connect these things for folks maybe that, so I come at this from a lot of different directions. I, I'm working as a journalist, I covered flood, been to so many flood recovery meetings since 2007, um, and I ended up in Congressman Kine's office trying to get people in those communities help. Uh, I know the kicker was different possibly than the Cook Creek, but my concern is that we probably haven't had quite the impacts yet <coughs> in this watershed that you've had over there. I just feel like that's going to happen, and especially if the dams are gone. So in the 70s, Soldiers Grove moved. After 2008, money spent, and it was part of a lot of FEMA stuff to raise houses, move houses, buyouts. Um, each community in the Kickapoo and the Upper Kickapoo right now is uh, implementing a flood mitigation plan. Every one of those communities is spending 10 to 15 million dollars. A lot of federal dollars have already gone. So at a time when things are getting worse, it feels like we're doing less. So try to you can match that up somehow. <laughs> or if there be, you know, there's potential solutions with small dams, land management practices, your, your information in one of your earlier presentations in the scoping part of this showed or study the Milsna, 11 dams in that, reduced peak flow by 50%. Now you combine that with some land use changes, you're getting close to what the dam did. But I don't feel like there's a coordinated effort to do that stuff. So I know my friend Greg Wabernick's here from Senator Baldwin's office, and <laughs> to pick on you, Greg, but it feels like there needs to be some kind of coordinated solution since this solution's going away. Yeah. I think there's to have a to create a new vision for land management in the Coon Creek watershed. Um, would be a likely outcome out of this study. But this study, we tried to kind of take a manageable bite out of flooding in the watershed. We tried to take a manageable bite, and the manageable bite was, do we replace these 14 dams or not? Right. And <coughs> it comes down to hard economics, and that's kind of like, I think back in the 60s, it's just my, or 58, my impression was the incentive there was to do what you could and the engineers designed these dams and when they were done, they slid the plan over to the economist and said justify it. This time around, the economist is driving the bus and the engineers are riding shotgun. <laughs> and it's just very difficult to ignore a benefit cost ratio that's I get so that. low. I understand that, but it, it also yeah. feels like, yes, that's a Herculean task to get people to do things, but it's falling to non-governmental people to do it. It feels like it shouldn't be trusted. Does that make sense? So there should be some commitment for funding. Can, can you put as part of your recommendations, there needs to be funding for this? Yeah. Yeah, I think there is. Uh, I think that portion of the report that was committed to land use changes can be used to justify the movement of federal funds through EQIP special initiatives, P program, which now pays technical assistance fees, uh, you know, to in the design and implementation process. So I think it. I think it has the potential to be a catalyst where one wasn't there before. Um, 
why would you if the dams are kind of doing their job and now that it's discovered they're not it's sort of a catalyst to say well what can be done and you get two choices you stay out of the floodplain or you commit more federal money to land treatment 1930s it must have felt like a huge staff too right mm -hmm. they did yeah but it took federal back yeah, and I, I think the, the federal programs in, are available, but maybe not as orchestrated as they need to be. That's and hopefully this will, hopefully this will be the catalyst for that. That's what I'm asking about. Where is the, <coughs> I think that piece is important to make sure that everybody's talking to each other. There's commitment to do that. I know our when the record of decision is rendered on this project, I know our agency will take this, try to take it a step farther. The watersheds are missing some things, coordination, demonstration farms, some things that are in other parts of the state that aren't here, and I, I hope we can kind of be a part of that. Um, so you model different cropland practices, obviously going all the grass and whatnot. Did you model different woodland practices managing it in different ways or was it just you know all of them no the model was um the runoff model left woodland woodland and converted cropland to grass there was nothing <coughs> it was to create an upper bookmark on conservation effort and allow a two-point interpolation between the flood model that exists today and what it could look like. Mm -hmm. And so I think at least in Coon Creek, it's a little different in outcome in West Fork Kickapoo, but it looks like land, uh, land treatment could compete with these large dams in a meaningful way. Because there could be a lot of opportunity there in Woodland too, you know, and you can kind of see it, um, and you stumbled across this because a, a guy dropped out of managed forest law, so now his taxes went way up so his tax incentive is to manage his, his woodlot now and I just stumbled across that the other day so it brought a whole new opportunity to this gentleman because for tax incentive purposes and maybe that's something you know and that's on a state level with taxes but maybe that's something with cropland where there's a tax incentive to manage your cropland but that's getting into whole political stuff too so I, oh, Eric course. just, I know he wants to say yeah, something about <laughs> that. <laughs> so, we haven't talked before this, but that was a great uh, segue. So, I'm super interested in the forests. They're roughly half of the landscape in this region. And so, we've been primarily focused on ag land because there's a lot of management that happens daily, monthly, seasonally. So, it makes sense as a starting place. But I think there are a lot of potential practices that can be done on the forest and lands. There's, a rich history of experimental monitoring in this region going back to the 30s and then later in the 60s and 70s and there were some pretty interesting studies just showing you know putting some of these dams right at the top of that hill slope where it's fractured bedrock uh, right underneath and that could allow a lot of infiltration to happen I think there's just a lot of um, unknowns still and so we're hoping to start up more of an experimental monitoring network and talking with the Forest Service and the DNR about starting up. So it's, it's beginning, but mm -hmm. we'll talk more. Yeah, go ahead, ma'am. Um, yeah. Land Information Office. I'm one of the custodians of um, land information data, both historic and contemporary, and offering sound accurate data is something that we pride ourselves on. Um, I've read in the report that it says after decommissioning of all the dams that the FEMA flood insurance rate maps will no longer be accurate. Um, I'm grateful to hear that there will be $100,000 put towards um, revising the FEMA flood maps for Coon Creek. I'm wondering if you could speak to any allocation and or timeline for this as well as Westport. Yeah, that's a really good question. and. If that's what's in the report, it, it might not be out of context. Our, our conclusions are, in conversation with the DNR floodplain staff, is that the base flood elevations uh, 
in the flood insurance study down the main stem of Coon Creek will not change as a result of the dams being removed. There is some A mapping in and around the dams. Zone A is the designation provided when there was no modeling done. Um, it's more of an artistic idea of where the 100-year floodplain might be. There, there does need to be some acknowledgement that the dams are missing and that those flood pools don't exist, but they really don't have any bearing on insurance rates in the valley. There will be no change in that regard. Yeah. However, making those adjustments in zoning mapping around those four dams, there is a cost associated with that, tw about 25000 and we hope to cover that, so, yeah. Yes, sir? Yeah, it's possible in the why did they take out all these tears with years ago? Up to my farm, we got these terraces that run half a mile down this ridge and drained all the water that was down there back up and put it back in this pond. And you want them coming from that? And I bought the terraces. And I know a bunch of them they took out of the pond. We yeah. paid them to put them in years ago. They ran the gold and ripped them out and they farmed it. Is that true? Yeah, the, the question was, is what happened to some of the terraces that were on the landscape? Historically, they seem to have disappeared, along with a lot of, the, a lot of strip cropping also, from, from what I understand. And I, you know, some of the county conservationists, I'll, I'll open that up to them, but I think equipment whiffs, new equipment whiffs, and uh, I'll just stop before I get myself in trouble. That's a good question, though, Bob. Where, 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 where do you have an answer for that, or Ben? So that's a good These guys monitor changes in the landscape through their transects. What he's saying, where it's a more, I'll get in trouble because what I've seen over my career, um, and it really comes down to conservation planning. That is not a priority in certain other offices anymore. It's about programs and keeping money out to the, on projects. And so when we did that, we're not out on the farms, working with landlords on the conservation plans, keeping the tolerable soil losses. We only stumble upon that when we have other programs, other needs to go out there and address it, like farm and So we understand that need is greatly needed. I mean, that's something we should be doing, doing. the gains there, um, I think are greater than what we're doing currently. So that's an opinion. So the observation is valid, right? But the reasons, the reasons landowners have to take out uh, the terraces and a lot of the strip cropping has to do with their op operation equipment size and things like that. But what Bob is saying is they're done there seems to be a shift in priorities where we're not really promoting or marketing the replacement of any of those losses either. I would say terraces are an important terraces are an important tool in the toolbox and as we're moving forward along with prairie buffers and other ways to slow down runoff terraces do need to be looked at again but it basically comes down to it's private land right they have their choice no one here is dictating anything beyond like a 10-year operation and maintenance plan so we can't we can't make people keep those terraces on, on private land yeah, go ahead. so you're talking about like just five years the decommission process is there any money allocated to the counties to solve some they've got a lot of people coming in and want to put in these small dams or, or newer projects to help mitigate the Dam's staying on. How? I mean, they're short on staff now. Both counties. What? Do you guys have a plan for that to get them stepped up to a point? I mean, if you're going to put just a number of dams straight up on top of the water, that's the end. I don't know. 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 I the price you know that was on there was what sixty five thousand. Yeah. I mean we did that one for less than thirteen. Yeah. Um, so uh, I think it's feasible, uh, but how is their staff going to keep up with 
with our needs because we're looking at a huge watershed. And these dams are phenomenal. You put enough of them in with the right practices, all of a sudden we're, we're building on something that, going back to 1933, and maybe farming field by field again instead of farm by farm. Yeah, the, the question is, is how do you, if a multitude of small farm ponds can make a reasonable, can act as a reasonable proxy or a replacement for the large dams, is there a way to kind of accelerate that implementation? And the, the observation is, is the staffing levels at the land and water and at NRCS are really low. And I think, as I mentioned before, I think we need to regroup to figure out how to get some money in here to get staffed up and promoted. And they are pushing some programs like RCPP where they they got, where you can hire a local. We can, the federal money can be moved into the counties for technical assistance money for hiring people to do the work. I think that might be one avenue. But your observations are valid. There's no one to do it. Um, and it might be impacting. Not enough. Not enough, yeah. There's people. But I, I kind of cut Matt off. Matt was kind of, did you want to make some observations about just the loss of strip cropping and terraces maybe in the landscape over the last few years? Or? Well, well, I would say this. I, I think this is a, a juncture, a moment in time where I think we need to stop and pause and think about the opportunities in front of us too. I mean, we've talked, we've talked about tax rate changes. There's been discussion. I don't want to bring up a big thing about ties to federal crop insurance and so forth, but the conservation ethic and what we started in the 30s here, while, while the cropping systems have changed and we can't expect to not change with them, the testimonials from those of you in this room, and I see faces here and I know names, of what you've done on your farm with the conversions of putting in the small dams and, and converting to systems that build organic matter, promote more nutrient cycling, promote how that might affect uh, how that water moves through some of these bedrock systems and geologic systems. I don't know what we even know. And Steve, I brought this up to you, but the models tell us one thing, but sometimes we just don't know. And I've listened to producers and landowners, like many of you in this room, tell me the change has been unbelievable. From where I was a decade ago with this row crop system to what I've done now with mixed species cover crops, and more rotational grazing here. The water that comes off this farm is just, the change is dramatic. And so I think, I mean, that's inspiration for me. I think that's inspiration for Bob, the other conservation staff, and I think we have to build off of that. Like Tim said, I mean, I think we get backing and support from the feds to continue to promote those types of systems. I'm optimistic, and I think that's where we need to be, so. Yes, ma'am. So I'm Nancy Weber, I'm the president of Coon Creek Watershed, Coon Creek Community Watershed Council, and I also am from this area, have property here, hail from the Coon Creek Watershed, is what we like to say when we introduce ourselves at our meetings. And, and I haven't gotten to meet you personally yet, Steve, but huh. nice yeah. to meet you. <laughs> um, and, you know, thank you. Uh, all and I'm not the person by the way who's coming up here to dismiss all of you I just people who know me know I can only keep my mouth shut so long and then here it comes um, thank you for your presentation very um, economic based engineering based and your consultants I'm sorry from Utah or Texas I, I don't remember but you know th thank you for the work that you've done our council actually got it's a uh, starting footing from, from Ben, because when the floods came in 2018, we all, uh, we came together, a group of people, and we said, what can we do to help ourselves? Because we didn't see the government rushing in to help us, right? And so we started to work, learn what watershed councils were, and, and work together to try to mitigate the flooding, right? And so we have, over the last few years, built wonderful relationships with our, our county conservationists who support this work, it, which actually Matt just described. 
um, very, very nicely. And I see huge opportunity where we are. But I have to put some context to this whole thing. Um, back in, as we know, the 1930s, right, huge uh, human-caused devastation on the landscape across the nation. And the Coon Creek watershed just happened to be the place that was picked out by the government to have this large-scale demonstration project. And so the government came to help. People didn't like it, and it was a, a very uh, difficult thing. But ultimately, about half the farms signed on and participated in the program. The university, and I'm looking at Dr. Booth over there, uh, University of Wisconsin-Madison, they came to help too, right? And so we all partnered together, the, the folks, the government, the university, and we worked together and did this wonderful thing that set the stage for uh, contour strips, all these conservation practices across the nation. And then in the 1950s, lo and behold, who came back again to help us, right, and put in these dams. Those would be the next step. So to your point earlier, Tim, here we find ourselves now in the, in the aughts, do we say? I'm not sure, 2000 somewhere. <coughs> and there's a little bit, no, there's a large sense of being left to deal with the problem. Um, the, the before us, it is compounded, whether we call it climate change or extreme weather, whatever it is, it's out there and it's happening and we deal with it. The gentleman in the back talking about the flooding and, and how it affects everything, I, I wholeheartedly agree, agree it does. I don't think that we can just talk in terms of a strip that's going to be flooded, because we've lived through this, right? And we have seen this, and we know that it's going to come again. It's a matter of when. We also know that when the dams are decommissioned, which, by the way, I am not here to say don't decommission the dams. I want to be abundantly clear on that. I don't want anything mistaken. I'm not here to say that. It's probably ultimately the right decision, but it's only a sliver of the decision. And I think that's what Tim was alluding to, and Tucker was alluding to, and other people in the room. But, um, what we would really like to do is work together to meet that uh, original scope of intent for this project was to address flood control and flood damage mitigation. And somehow <coughs> that became a, uh, only the preliminary purpose, and things got narrowed down to just looking at the dams and what happens if the dam fails, so let's protect against just the dam breach, rather than rather than just, let's look at the whole flooding picture. And I, I do think that's where we need to be. I, I know you um, explained benefit-cost ratio, which this project doesn't meet. I, I know that you all justify it with the um, loss of life potential, things like that, which is good, that's right. Were there benefit cost analyses on the other options? That that would be one question that I would have. I but I did, I will be honest, I did not read all the lab reports because I knew that I would not understand them. So I thought, okay, I'll skip to the other, I don't know, 800 pages, whatever it was that wasn't that. And I did not see it in there. But um, maybe you can correct me on that. So what we would propose, and there's probably other things I need to say too, but um, I agree with what Matt Hanwell said about let's pause, let's take a breath, appreciate the opportunities, absolutely but also to understand what is the big picture here and what, what are we doing? Let's take the time, let's step back, and I'm speaking now to the counties, to say directly, hey, you don't have to sign this thing on May 1st and go forward. We could take a breath. We could all work together with you guys, with the university. <coughs> the way you say it, <coughs> yeah. 
So I finally, after having read your study about a year ago, or your report on the stochastic, whatever it is, intensity, duration, frequency of rainfall, finally this morning I looked up the meaning of that word. And it means unpredictable and aptly named, right? And, and you spoke too about the unpredictable, unpredictability of climate change. We are totally in an unpredictable situation here. We're immersed in it. We don't know what is going to happen next. That causes a lot of angst. And I think people would feel better if we could address this together rather than hearing a report, reading a report, and just maybe being in the comments section. Can we work together to create solution that would help us put in those million points of mitigation to prepare for the V notch that's going to let the water come flowing through. And I don't know that we necessarily have to be in an absolute rush to have an agreement signed by May 1st so that we can go forward and, and maybe look at some of these other historical um, <coughs> preservation opportunities as well because we know that they are out there. There's probably some questions buried in there. <laughs> I will stop for right now, but I just I just wanted I had to I had to speak that and say that there's there's a larger thing that we need to think about and, and this is part of it. But how can we address the whole issue working with you for you guys, you know, move forward with this and lives are gonna be affected here. Lives and properties beyond the floodplain. It it just you know, because great. Right? Stochastic. We don't know what's coming. Uh, thanks for those comments, Nancy. I appreciate that. And um, I think the study is narrow in scope, right? It deals primarily with what we know and what we have control over, which is the county has control over the footprints of the dam, and we know the dams have the potential to fail, and so this. The study had a lot to do with the disposition of the dams, and it had less to do with what can we do for upland land management and treatment in terms of conservation practices, farm ponds, strip cropping, and whatever. And the study didn't dive into that because we don't hardly have any control at, over it at all on private land. Can I pop in? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay, so you have these things called watershed councils and they are made up of anybody who wants to ours is um, they, they're different across the state 46 47 of them whatever they are made up of uh, people that are interested in conservation and want to implement practices on their, on their property ours is not just farmers we have expanded beyond that to include anybody and everybody with an interest in concrete watershed so if you live in a village, if you live out of a township, if you live in Virginia somewhere and you're interested in this watershed, you can absolutely join. And we try to address beyond just conservation for the farmer. Uh, we're very excited about Eric beginning to look into the forestry practices and things that can be done there, focusing on uh, urban practices as well. So not just the, the narrow focus of agriculture, long way of saying that we are potentially in a place to, to do some of the things that you guys as the government can't do. You can't come in and say you're going to do this, you're going to do that. But through educating, through awareness, through working with our partners and hopefully putting some proof of concept pieces on the ground where people can come and look, be persuasive, right? And people may want to join on. They have. We have already been making differences. Watershed councils across the state have been making differences. And I can't help but know that back in the 30s, it only took half of the farms to make a huge difference. And actually, it was, became even less than that because not all they, not all of them continued to comply with what they were supposed to do. So it doesn't take everybody. It's not insurmountable. We can work together to transform this landscape. And um, maybe part of the way to do that is again through those many points of mitigation that Tim was bringing up. So that's, that's what I would offer as far as 
you guys rightly saying you're not in control, you're not. Yeah. You know, but but there's a partner out here well, in right. terms of the folks that uh, are interested in helping. Yeah, and I think there's other elements that the plan didn't address either, right? It it did get into water quality. Right. It did get into improving <coughs> gross value or production on cropland. I mean, there are a lot of other elements that it didn't touch on. So I appreciate that. There are, there's part of me that, like, as a federal employee, it, but I do feel it can, it's not necessarily directed in the right place. And it's not, at the moment, it isn't directed toward the staff time that's needed to get, to replace the terraces to market where the farm ponds could go, uh, to provide the support that the counties need to move that federal money. So, but I think the money's there. I mean, the IRA moved a lot, like an extra 20 million into Wisconsin. So, um, hopefully, <coughs> the weaknesses in the report make as a compelling statement as uh, the strengths of the report. And maybe it is kind of a rallying point. And I don't mind the report being used that way. That look, there's shortcomings. So what are you gonna do about it? And I think I think it is a good rallying point, Nancy. So I appreciate your comments. I do. Thank you. I'd I'd like to expand on that conversation a bit. Uh, I'm gonna introduce myself uh, and uh, give a little bit about my background. Uh, my name is Chris Fergus. I live in Westby. Uh, I'm a very active fisherman in the area. Uh, probably had about 100 days on the water last year, and probably about half of those were in uh, the Coon Creek watershed right here. Uh, I love this river. I love the watershed. Uh, it's a beautiful place, and there's some great resources uh, that are here. Um, I also happen to be uh, an environmental consultant. My background is wetland and stream ecology and restoration. Uh, I, I do a lot of these sorts of things. I've, I've read the draft EIS. I think it was very well written. I contribute to a lot of those on a lot of other projects as well. Uh, for, for a company that's out of the south, I was they had on, on some of the, uh, the ecological aspects, uh, the particularly where and the intensity of some of the invasive species are across the watershed, both here uh, as well as the West Fork. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the federal government's coming in, they're, they're putting in millions of dollars here to really examine some intensive uh, problems and bringing solutions to those. Uh, but we really have an opportunity here as a community to kind of come up from the bottom, grassroots, like we're saying with the council, uh, and, and address some of uh, what, I would, what I would consider are more extensive issues, right? They're watershed wide. If we can all pick up pieces with it with our own properties and parcels with assistance, then we can make uh, you know, a wholesale change uh, in the community. Um, I, I help with grant writing with nonprofits. I'm, I'm happy to explore uh, any sort of land conservation practices and partnerships with um, you know, the counties and, and other groups. There, there's a lot of professionals with a lot of technical information here that live here and are, and are willing to help and support uh, all of us. So uh, I, I, I'm personally for uh, the dam removals. I, I, all the science makes sense, the economics makes sense. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of, I, I don't want to call them shortcomings because they're not in there. I think that report is very focused on, on again, that intensive problem, uh, but there's still a lot of uh, a lot of dialogue that can happen, a lot of action that can happen right here in the community that we can take ownership of. So if anyone wants to talk further about that later, uh, I'll be around after also be at the West Fork meeting. So again, my name is Chris Fergus. Thank you. Thank you. I was just wondering, I know uh, I used to work in conservation, been out of it a little while, but I know in the past there were some larger, um, in this region, not necessarily Wisconsin, I think some of it was you know, just in the Midwest, they had larger watershed grants where they knew that a specific watershed needed a lot of um, conservation practices that needed to be implemented. So I believe it was NRCS would target a specific watershed. They'd identify certain practices that they said, these are the key practices we want implemented. And, you know, they gave a larger amount of equip funds and other funds for that watershed just to be used for those practices. And I'm wondering if that's still a possibility, if those grants are still a possibility. And then also, um, is uh, can this project 
um, provide that recommendation that this is what's needed. Um, this is what we see is needed once these dams are removed. We, we see the need for something like this to happen, more conservation practices as, as a recommendation <coughs> that yeah. might push a, a grant opportunity like that. Yeah, the question is, is there uh, targeted federal money for a particular watershed? <coughs> and the answer is yes, and it's as strong and as lucrative as I've ever seen it. Um, but it does require um, and put it together. I, I'm thinking specifically of RCPP. What's driving that money, or what? Can you say what RCPP is? Regional, regional, regional conservation targeting program. Yeah. <clears throat> what moves the money quicker, or what concentrates it in a watershed, is when you can provide measurable outcomes. Because I think Congress and probably the public in general is demanding a little more uh, results-driven. Uh, outcomes for the money they spend. So I think the modeling that was done at least on the on the, the in this uh, in this study and some of the watershed models that are available lend itself to a sponsor picking it up and directing money into the watershed and I think this only supports the reason to do it. I think it it can be cited as uh, a major reason why the money should be targeted into Coon Creek and I have every expectation there will be is published I believe that um, well, one thing that through the oral narrative stories of flood meetings that have happened you know here in Coon Valley the flood, at the watershed council people are asking you know what is going to be done when these dams are are removed. People are feeling that that the problems and the solutions are left left out to them. And it seems that the preferred path forward is doing just that. Um, at the same time, there is opportunity within our NRCS. There is funding there. In this watershed, we have a unique opportunity because we have 90 years of legacy, 90 years of people coming together, 90 years of showing that we can actually do this. We can have people come together and make changes on. It shows that you know if you make changes on the landscape, you can have an effect that up to almost the, I think it was 200 year flood level, you're having the same amount of protection on stream level rise. But what that's also doing is, it's not just that little little corridor, right? Like like the, the effects that are happening in our watershed is not just that 228 acres. Our road, you know, a couple inches of rain. That's not the stream coming up. That's that culverts that the townships are paying for. That's roads that are being rebuilt. That is roads that are used for emergency vehicles that are being washed out that now they can't use. So it's more than just stream rise. Um, in addition, the small farm ponds, again, they're having effects that are greater than just, you know, stream level rise. So you, I think what the report did a really good job was identifying that there are solutions there. In this conversation, it sounds like there are resources available through NRCS, whether it's RCPP, other IRA allocated funds. Is there a way to have the preferred path forward, coordinate that. People are asking for it. Everybody wants to have something moving forward. The counties listening, I hope, people are asking for this. By signing on May 1st and not having a plan moving forward, what is that telling everyone? Like, can, can the preferred path be at least a coordination, at least saying we should coordinate funds, we should coordinate efforts, we should look at this some money for developing a plan that's community driven so that we can come up with solutions. Yeah, I think the, uh, there is a void that needs to be filled 
with coordinated leadership on it. I feel the county conservationists uh, can provide it. Um, I think the federal government can provide the money. These RCPP grants that I've seen are pushing $10 million that you can put into a single watershed. That should move the needle a little ways. It, the report at least shows last couple nights was at least in the Coon Creek watershed I was led to believe that when you start getting five or six seven inches of rain that you know con conservation isn't going to matter I mean you get 11 hour 11 inches of rain in six hours that it doesn't matter what you're growing and I think with the modeling kind of shows is no that's not correct it can have an effect on some of these larger events um, and so it holds promise that something can be done. I think the federal money is there. I think it can be a, a rallying point for the Coon Creek Watershed Coalition in conjunction like with Vernon and Monroe and La Crosse Land and Water to, to actually start targeting some of this federal money for a very specific reason because it can be a reasonable replacement for dams if it's done right and it's done to adequate scope. At the end of the day, you know, this country values private land ownership and people's ability to do what they want to do with the land they own. That's going to be a hurdle. You know, and that's why the report stopped where the report did stop. Because at the end of the day, there's no sense fine-tuning your model to land that you have no control over. But wouldn't that be the preferred path? Yeah. Versus, I mean, versus at least doing nothing. Right. Notching a dam is then doing nothing to address the risks that have been identified since the 1920s, 1930s, 1940s, all the past and 50s dams are built in the 60s. Yeah. The only thing that notching does is prevent breach. Yeah. And right. I just mean by the, the not just going in, but then there's nothing, there's no plan in place to address the problem that has only been increasing since the 1930s. Go ahead, ben. So, Thank you, Eric. But it's not like there's been nothing going on, and I, I want to share some of the optimism, right, like that Nancy spoke of. I mean, you know that we come to the meetings, we're very happy. A lot of the faces in this room are already contributing to a lot of work. We have a land and That's water, we have a lot, and, and I didn't take offense, because I know, where you, I know yeah. you, and I know your land management, which is helpful. I know your contribution to the Coon Creek Watershed, which is wonderful, and I see a lot of those folks in here. <coughs> Um, you know, the university has been an amazing partner. Uh, Valley Stewardship Network, the watershed groups. Um, I'm a really big fan of Justin Olson right here. We're extremely lucky to have him in Monroe and Vernon County. Uh, we have a watershed planner who never existed, who's doing the ACPF tool. So we're now, instead of just, you know, some loudmouth farmer who comes into the room, we can actually target our efforts a little bit more so I mean since 2018 and since uh, there has been progress now it's easy for me in my ripe old age to get very cynical uh, but we there's a lot of optimism in this room and then really we can serve as a model to show Monroe and La Crosse County what to do because they're the ones really messing up. <laughs> <laughs> so they've been excellent partners as well our neighbors and you know it, it is next level um but coon creek and us have made that effort to do the nine key element <coughs> and right so that is a more even more sub watershed concentrated plan but absolutely uh, and and i do have to thank vernon county as well like we will have two more staff you know including the watershed planner and one additional one than we've had in you know 20 years so it, it's tiny, it, it is small benefits, but um, getting that many more practices out on the land, and I absolutely believe that our NRCS partners are, are there for us to help. So there is a lot of optimism. And actually, I just want to tie a bow really quick on this whole damn discussion. Um, <laughs> we didn't really mention Jersey Valley, and we will at the other meeting. That's the one that they're offering for us to to replace, um, and so that is one of the biggest decisions for Vernon County to make. Otherwise, 
they got us a variance with their hard work for a hundred percent funding of the damn decommissioning and I know that's annoying that it doesn't come with all the other resources that we do know we need to work towards to deal with these dams being gone but a hundred percent funding for damn decommissioning I can pretty much guarantee it'll never get better <laughs> than that right so really I am recommending that Vernon County uh, essentially go forward when in doubt rip it out and uh, I think that's really our best option. But all of the rest of this discussion is extremely important, and it, I like the million.